got involved in in the, in the last few years that's a little bit different uh, than what I'm used to. The, so the uh, title I originally gave to Andrew for the talk was A Tourist Guide to Stellar Tides, but this isn't really uh, a great tourist's guide in that I'm going to leave a lot of stuff out, but the tourist bit is correct. Right now, I'm not a, uh, a native person to the country of Stellar Tides. I'm, I'm a foreigner. I'm just visiting, uh, but I'm learning about them, uh, and what I'm going to share with you today is really uh, my adventure discovering Stellar Tides and exploring them uh, and then sort of reporting back uh, 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 what I found out. Uh, so in a sense, uh, a better title for the talk would have been Stellar Tides, a travelogue, which is just my account of this, this little adventure I've been on. Uh, so I originally got the motivation uh, to sort of go on this journey a few years ago. Uh, I was, uh, uh, for the last, uh, I guess, 15 or so years, I've been working uh, on uh, w waves and oscillations in stars at Madison, but before then I, uh, I sort of came from a background of uh, 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 waves, rotation, oscillations, mass loss uh, in massive stars, and my PhD thesis was on line profile variations uh, of oscillating hot stars. Uh, so I would say I'm very much at home with sort of waves and instabilities and things like that, but not so much with tides. Uh, and uh, a big focus of my research since I've been at Madison has been developing the Gaia Stellar, Stellar Oscillation Code and the Mesa Stellar Revolution Code. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these uh, pieces of software. Uh, for those that aren't, uh, Mesa uh, is a, a piece of software that will construct a model for a star and then simulate how it changes over time as it evolves from birth to death. Uh, and then Gaia is another piece of software that can take a model produced by Mesa uh, and figure out how it will oscillate, and we can use the output from Gaia to compare against observations. And of course, as the study of stellar oscillations, astroseismology, is, is really one of the things that Leuven is, is world famous for, so uh, I'm sure many of you are already, already familiar with all of this. Uh, back in 2016, uh, uh, I served as the uh, external thesis examiner for Zhao Guo at uh, Georgia State University, uh, and he had a, a PhD, uh, he was defending his PhD thesis on uh, applying astroseismology in binary systems, uh, and as part of his PhD work, he had modified my Jaya code to simulate stellar tides, and this was really surprising to me, because I, I really didn't think tides had anything to do with stellar oscillations. Uh, so it turns out the techniques that Zhao had used, uh, he had learned from a, a, a work done uh, in 2013, uh, by Francesca Valsecchi. Uh, she was based at Northwestern University, uh, and she had learned everything she knew about tides from Bart Willems, who's from here originally, uh, and he had learned everything he knew about tides from Paul Smeyers, uh, who also uh, was based at Leuven, uh, retired quite a while ago, uh, but did some really foundational work on stellar tides. Uh, so in a sense, uh, there was this sort of game of whisper uh, all the way from Paul Smeyers through to Zhao Guo that then ended up in my ear uh, and made me think, huh, maybe there's some interesting stuff here I should look into, and especially uh, if there's some new capability I could add to Jaya to model tides, that could be pretty exciting. Uh, so in order to embark on this journey to a distant and foreign land, uh, I had to do a little bit of preparation. So at the beginning, uh, my understanding of tides was pretty limited uh, to well, this is kind of a gravitational distortion of a body due to a nearby body, uh, and it can occur uh, both on uh, the Earth, where the tides are raised primarily by the moon, uh, and there's a sort of tidal bulge here, uh, where the, near, uh, the, uh, uh, the oceans on a line between the moon and the Earth uh, are raised high, uh, and the oceans at sort of 90 degrees to that are low, uh, but we can also get tides in binary stars, and if the binaries are close enough, uh, uh, the tides distort the stars into sort of ellipsoidal figures, uh, and we can get variability from that. Uh, it turns out that there's uh, a lot more to tides than just that simple picture. I bet you're not surprised by that. Uh, so uh, let me just run down a brief history of the study of tides. So the first person to really note that there was a link between tides uh, and the position of the moon and the sun uh, was uh, Seleucus of Seleucia uh, in the second century uh, uh, before Common Era. 
So that was a long time ago. He, he really didn't have any idea what caused them, but he noted that they were linked to the positions of the Earth, uh, of the Moon and the Sun. Uh, we really had to wait until a theory of gravitation from Isaac Newton before we uh, could understand that tides were a consequence of the gravitational pull of the moon uh, and to a lesser extent the sun. Uh, but uh, Newton's theory of tides uh, really focused on the hydrostatic effect of the gravitational potential uh, of the moon. Basically, the uh, moon's gravitational, uh, the presumption was that the Earth's oceans. Uh, instantaneously deform themselves to come into hydrostatic equilibrium with the gravitational potential uh, of the nearby moon. Later on, uh, Pierre Simon uh, Laplace uh, pointed out that as well as this instantaneous hydrostatic ad adjustment uh, for uh, motions over short timescales, there's also going to be a hydrodynamical aspect uh, to the tidal response, which is um, more like sort of waves. Uh, large-scale waves raised by the tides rather than a continuous sort of hydrostatic adjustment. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, 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 George Darwin, who was the son of Charles Darwin, of origin of the species fame, uh, uh, really dove into tides in a very systematic way and published a huge volume of literature on them. And in fact, uh, a lot of the modern theory of tides is built on, on Darwin's work. Uh, and uh, he uh, pointed out that uh, tidal friction, this, so that uh, I put friction in quotes because uh, it's not friction as we would understand it that you get from sort of rubbing uh, uh, against a rough surface. It's more just the dissipation of tidal energy. This can result in the long-term evolution of orbits uh, by transferring angular momentum from the orbit to the bodies experiencing the tides uh, and vice versa. Uh, and this can cause uh, orbits to circularize or decircularize, to shrink or to grow. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, I was actually flicking through one of Darwin's uh, uh, big treatises on tides last night, uh, and I came across a page where he also mentions the possibility of tides in binary star systems. Uh, so uh, he had sort of uh, conjectured that stellar tides may be important as well. In the 20th century, uh, uh, the, uh, probably the earliest work, uh, detailed work on astrophysical tides was done by Thomas Cowling in the 1940s. For those of you who are familiar with the so-called Cowling approximation, which is where we uh, neglect the perturbations to uh, a star's self-gravitational potential when doing pulsation calculations, that same paper is, uh, is actually focused on uh, tid tidal forcing of polytropes, uh, polytropic stars, uh, and so, you know, Cowling was really after tides in that paper that most of us now cite because we're interested in stellar oscillations. So that's, uh, a, again, a hint that uh, stellar tides and stellar oscillations are perhaps not quite as different from each other as one might think. In the 1970s, uh, Jean-Paul Zahn uh, pointed out that uh, the uh, predominant uh, source of tidal friction in stars with radiative envelopes uh, is actually going to be from uh, resonances between the uh, uh, forcing by the uh, tidal potential and the star's free oscillation modes. And when you get this resonant forcing, uh, the tide that's raised can be much stronger than uh, it would be out of resonance, uh, and the amount of uh, tidal dissipation, the amount of friction is much larger, uh, and so you'll get much more rapid evolution than you might expect. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, a seminal paper in uh, 81 by Piet Hart uh, uh, argued that uh, in binary systems, there's going to be a well-defined sort of pathway uh, that the orbit follows towards a circularized and synchronized orbit. Uh, first of all, uh, the binary system will come into pseudo-synchronous rotation, which basically means that the rotation of each star basically... Uh, is kind of linked to the peri periastron angular velocity of the companion. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not quite the same as proper synchronization where the stars always face each other uh, because uh, in an eccentric orbit, uh, the uh, rate at which the companion orbits round changes and you can't have the star instantaneously adjusting its rotation rate. But pseudo-synchronous rotation uh, in a binary system is the first thing that we expect to uh, occur, that the system will first of all evolve to a pseudo-synchronous rotation rate, uh, and then it will gradually circularize, and you'll end up with a circularized and synchronized system. Uh, and then in the 1990s, uh, uh, and in fact in the few years leading up to that, 
Uh, Paul Smeyers really led the way uh, with highlighting uh, uh, the link between stellar tides and stellar oscillations uh, and how one could view tides as just the sort of forced counterpart to free oscillations in just the same way that when we learn about a simple harmonic oscillator as an undergrad, we first of all learn about free oscillation, let's say a pendulum swinging backwards and forwards, but then we solve the problem where we're shaking the pendulum and we're calculating uh, 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 what the response is in res uh, 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 due to our shaking. Uh, and you can view stellar tides uh, in exactly the same light. They're just the forced oscillation counterpart to free oscillations that we study when we do astroseismology. So uh, that's my potted history. Uh, of course, studying stellar tides would be kind of boring if there wasn't some kind of observational evidence that they actually exist. Uh, and there's plenty out there. Uh, we've known about uh, ellipsoidal variables for uh, many, many years. This is a, a, a light curve of a, a very curious ellipsoidal variable, V723mon, uh, that was, uh, I think this is a uh, uh, Kelt uh, observation. So this is, uh, I guess Kelt is, a, is really a, a supernova survey, I think. I'm a theoretician, so you'll have to forgive my... Uh, uh, conjecturing, but uh, ellipsoidal variables uh, are pairs of stars that are in circular orbits that are so close that uh, the star's neutral gravitational fields distort them into ellipses, and as they rotate around each other, their projected area on the sky changes, uh, and uh, parts of the star with different surface temperatures are exposed to us. Uh, and as a result of this uh, uh, rotation, we see a variability in the brightness of the, uh, the overall system uh, that uh, shows a characteristic double peak over one rotation period. Uh, and the distortion of the stars and the change in their surface temperatures due to their proximity uh, is a sort of extreme example of a stellar tide. Uh, so what's interesting about this particular system uh, is that uh, if you try to model it, as they've done here with the uh, Phoebe light curve modeling tool, uh, you find that the companion... Uh, uh, is emitting low, no light, but has a mass of uh, probably a, a few solar masses. Uh, and the companion's almost certainly a compact object and probably a black hole. Uh, so this is the case of an ellipsoidal variable where only one of the stars is actually a star and the other one is a compact object. Uh, okay, so in this plot on the right, we have another example uh, of uh, t uh, uh, direct evidence for uh, uh, stellar tides. This is a heartbeat star. So heartbeat stars uh, can be thought of as extremely eccentric uh, ellipsoidal variables. So rather than two stars orbiting around each other in circular orbits, we have them on very elliptical orbits, and there's only really a, a tidal effect uh, at the point of closest approach at periastron. Uh, and at periastron, we get this distinctive uh, budum signal in the light curve that's kind of reminiscent of the normal sinus rhythm of the human heart, and that's why they're called heartbeat stars. But away from periastron, uh, there's maybe not that much going on, although uh, uh, I wouldn't be so sure that this is just noise. It could actually be signal. Uh, and as I'll go on to show, uh, in, in fact, there's exciting stuff happening in these heartbeat stars even away from periastron that can tell us something about them. So heartbeat stars were only first discovered uh, after the launch of Kepler, uh, before then, uh, we didn't know about them. They were one of the new results discovered by Kepler. Uh, and they're really, really interesting systems, and TESS is finding a whole load as well. Uh, so uh, here we have uh, uh, direct evidence of uh, very close-in circularized, uh, uh, or tides in very close-in circularized binaries, and here for tides in very eccentric binaries. There's also plenty of indirect evidence for stellar tides. Uh, that we can glean from looking at whole populations of stars. So this is a period versus eccentricity diagram uh, for a selection of giants, both from clusters and, and, and field stars. Uh, and what you will note is that uh, for long periods, so that corresponds to wide binaries, the eccentricity can be quite large. But for the short period uh, uh, binaries, the eccentricity is very close to zero, so that the orbits have become circularized. And the mechanism for circularizing these orbits is tides. It's that tidal friction uh, that uh, Darwin first conjectured uh, would be able to modify the orbits of the, uh, the system. Uh, this is a, a, a another plot from a study of uh, the stellar rotation in systems that host a hot Jupiter. 
Uh, and the uh, x-axis is a sort of inverse age parameter. So the oldest systems are on the left-hand side, uh, and the youngest systems are on the right-hand side. Uh, and what's plotted uh, is the rotation period offset. So a larger value means uh, slower rotation, a smaller value means faster rotation. So we see that the oldest systems actually have a star that is rotating, uh, on average, faster than the youngest systems. And this is uh, thought to be evidence of a tidal spin-up of the star uh, due to uh, uh, the uh, effect of the hot Jupiter orbiting around it. So another sort of indirect evidence uh, for stellar tides. Okay, so bef uh, with the history and uh, a little bit of uh, sort of looking in the brochure, seeing what one can expect to find, uh, before one sets off on a, a daunting adventure, one also needs to find an expert guide. Uh, and for me, the guide I found uh, was uh, Meng Sun, uh, who uh, in uh, 2018 had just finished up a postdoc, uh, sorry, uh, her grad studies at the University of Virginia with Phil Aris, uh, and she had worked on uh, pulsating white dwarfs and orbital decay, and I was looking to hire a postdoc uh, to come and work with me on adding tidal capabilities to Jaya. Uh, and so she joined me in 2018, uh, and was with me till uh, 2021, so through the pandemic, uh, and together we got some really neat stuff accomplished, as I'll show later on, uh, and she was absolutely invaluable as somebody with sort of prior experience of tides, but also a really uh, 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 keen insight uh, and a real pleasure to work with. Uh, and then in 2021, she uh, left me to go and uh, uh, do a postdoc at Northwestern, uh, which is just a few hours down the road from uh, uh, Madison. Uh, so she didn't go far, and since then she's been working with Vicky Calagara on the Poseidon uh, uh, binary population synthesis code. Uh, and I, I continue to collaborate with her, so uh, I was very, very lucky to have her uh, guide me on this expedition. Okay, so let's actually talk about the trip. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start off by uh, uh, putting down a little bit of theory. The next few slides have equations. Please don't be daunted. Uh, uh, if you're in danger of being daunted, just go to sleep. It's exactly what I would do, OK? Uh, so uh, let's think about a binary system consisting of a, a star and a point mass companion. The mass of the star is m. Uh, the point mass has a mass qm, so q is the mass fraction. Uh, and the radius of the primary is r, and we assume that the, this point mass companion uh, is at some position vector r2 then the gravitational potential of this point mass uh, at some position r is just given by this formula. Uh, so it's a relatively simple formula, but uh, in it there's a lot of messiness. Uh, in particular, the position of the secondary star changes with time. Uh, so uh, a way of dealing with this potential uh, is to uh, expand it uh, as a superposition uh, of partial potentials uh, in both space and time, uh, and I'm going to show you how to do that on the next slide. And this sort of technique of uh, expand, expanding the potential uh, was first introduced by Darwin when he did this really thorough analysis of the problem. So if we do a multipole expansion in space, yeah, you remember that horrible thing you had to do when you studied electrostatics? So, you know, spherical harmonics and Laplace expansion and all of that. Uh, and then also we do a Fourier expansion in time because the orbit is periodic, so we can do a Fourier series expansion uh, uh, of this periodic forcing. Uh, then we end up with this nasty-looking expression, but it's actually not too bad. Okay, so the leading term uh, is actually constant, and since the force generated by the potential uh, is given by the gradient of the potential, th this term doesn't contribute anything to the tidal force. The next term, this one here, uh, is actually the centripetal potential. It, this gives rise to the uh, circular force uh, uh, that keeps basically the uh, binary system bound. That is the force of attraction on the star by the point mass that, that keeps it orbiting round in a closed orbit. It's this final term here that gives rise to the tide. Uh, so uh, uh, the gradient of this term gives rise to the force uh, that in turn generates the, the tides. You'll notice uh, it has a space dependence in, radi uh, in radial coordinate that goes as r to the l. The angular dependence is our good friends, the spherical harmonics. And then the time dependence 
uh, is a sort of a complex exponential time dependence uh, with a, uh, a frequency that's integer multiples of the orbital frequency. So the tidal uh, forcing uh, occurs at the orbital frequency, twice the orbital frequency, three times, and so on. And then this is a triply nested summation uh, with the uh, uh, azimuthal order going from two upwards, the harmonic degree over all possible values of azim uh, uh, sorry, harmonic degree from two upwards, azimuthal order over all possible values of the uh, uh, harmonic degree, and then the Fourier index k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. The overall strength of the tidal potential uh, scales as the mass ratio uh, uh, divided by the semi-major semi axis cubed. So the strength of the tide drops off as the sort of average separation uh, of the two stars cubed, uh, and we can only expect tides to be important, therefore, in close by binaries, not really distant ones. Uh, and we've already seen that in that plot that showed only the uh, short period binaries that are close together tend to be circularized. Okay, so uh, if we know the form of the uh, 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 tidal potential acting on the star that's generated by this point mass companion, uh, we can, in principle, calculate how the star will respond to these external forces that it's being subject to. Uh, and if we assume that the, uh, the binary uh, companion is not too close, so we can treat the tide as a small perturbation. Uh, then we can use uh, uh, a, a linearized version of the hydrodynamical equations to figure out how the star is going to respond to this tidal forcing. So these are the linearized versions of uh, the, uh, the mass conservation equation, the momentum conservation equation, and Poisson's equation. And there's also a linearized equation of state we have to throw in at some point. Uh, that links the uh, density perturbation to the pressure perturbation. Uh, and on the right-hand side here of the momentum equation, we have the usual terms that goes the gradient of the uh, pressure perturbation, the density perturbation, the perturbation to the star's own self-gravitational field, and then this term here, this is the gradient of the tidal potential uh, that's arising from the companion. Uh, now, if I just get rid of that term, and just write it like this, these are the equations of stellar oscillation, okay? So all that tides do is they add an extra term to the oscillation equations, uh, but interestingly, this extra term makes the equations inhomogeneous. The extra term doesn't depend on the, uh, the, the magnitude of the perturbations. It, it kind of, it's, its own amplitude is set by that little epsilon t term. Uh, and so what's really interesting when we add this extra term in due to tidal forcing is that the whole nature of the problem changes. For free oscillations, uh, we don't know a priori what the frequency of the oscillations is. We have to self-consistently solve for the frequency at the same time that we solve for all of the perturbed variables. Uh, so the frequency is an eigenvalue of the, uh, uh, the equations. It's an output. In the tidal case, though, when we have forced oscillations, we know exactly what frequency we're dealing with. In fact, we have to deal with a whole ensemble of frequencies that are all integer multiples of the orbital frequency. So the, the frequency is no longer an output. It's no longer an eigenvalue. It's an input. Uh, and rather than solving a homogeneous problem, we're solving an inhomogeneous problem. So at a mathematical level, there's kind of a change in, in, in the the characteristic uh, of what kind of problem we're solving, but at the same time, all of the basic equations are the same, apart from just this extra term. Uh, so uh, the work I did with Meng, uh, uh, and also uh, 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 Zhao Guo, who had given me the original idea uh, of mo uh, modifying Jaya uh, to incorporate tides, ultimately led to this paper that came out uh, uh, in March last year, uh, which was really about the modifications that we had made to my Jaya oscillation code in order to support modeling of tides. Uh, and uh, the code has been available for nearly a year now to do this. In, in fact, for uh, enterprising individuals, it's been available for much longer. I just didn't publicize it. Uh, and uh, 
this, uh, uh, this sort of extra feature in Jira actually comes as a new executable called Jira uh, uh, underscore tides. Uh, and basically, the way it works is when you launch a Jira tides calculation, uh, you specify orbital parameters for the system uh, and the mass of the companion. Uh, and then it will uh, loop over all possible combinations of those indices L, M, and K in that triple summation for the tidal potential. Uh, it, it only does those indices that it knows will make a non-negligible contribution to the tide, however, because remember, those summations formally go to infinity. Uh, and for each combination of L, M, and K, it will solve for the response of the star to the uh, individual term in the potential summation uh, that has those indices. Uh, to find what we call the partial tidal response. Now, uh, this is a really uh, uh, important computational simplification. When we calculate the response of the star uh, to the overall tidal potential, uh, we can treat each term in the triple summation separately and solve for the response of the star just to a single term in that summation, a partial potential, uh, and from that get a partial tidal response. And when we've done that, for all possible combinations of L, M, and K, uh, we can uh, add up all of the partial responses with the appropriate spherical harmonics and uh, E to the I, K, omega T uh, to obtain the full uh, tidal response, uh, basically a, a description of the uh, uh, displacement and pressure perturbation and density perturbation all throughout the star and at all times. Uh, and this is a complete solution, and there are no free parameters in this. We, we don't even need to assume what amplitude the tidal response has. This is unlike free oscillations, where in linear theory, we don't know what the amplitude should be. In this case, we know exactly what the amplitude should be. So it's a calculation with no free parameters, uh, which is pretty neat. Okay, so uh, uh, in the next few slides, I need to uh, uh, show you some examples of applying gyatides to a, a, a few different stellar models. Uh, so this is a, uh, an example of uh, the tidal response of a 2.3 solar mass stellar model that's kind of representative of uh, uh, the archetypal heartbeat star KOI 54, which was one of the ones discovered by Kepler. Uh, and what we're doing is we're considering a single partial potential with L equals two and uh, M equals zero, uh, and we're forcing it at, at, uh, 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 over a range of different frequencies and basically seeing how the star responds to being squeezed by a particular term in that big summation. Uh, so this is a plot uh, of the uh, surface uh, radial displacement amplitude and the surface uh, radial, uh, radiative flux perturbation. Uh, and you can see that, uh, uh, at least at the right-hand end of the plot, there are all these kind of spikes uh, uh, in the curves where the response is rather large. I should note also, uh, these are this is a logarithmic plot. Uh, so here, you know, we're talking about a response that's six orders of magnitude uh, at the peak, uh, uh, larger than where it would be at the trough. Uh, and what's happening here is exactly uh, what was uh, predicted uh, by, uh, I'm just trying to think back to my history. Uh, I think it was cowling, okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, that the response is much larger when the uh, forcing frequency sigma happens to coincide with one of the star's uh, uh, normal mode frequencies, with one of the frequencies of oscillation uh, of a, uh, a normal mode. Uh, and this is really a case of, of resonance. You remember, going back to the pendulum, if I happen to shake the pendulum away from its natural frequency, it'll maybe move a little bit, but if I happen to shake it very close to its natural frequency, we'll get a resonance and the pendulum uh, will swing with a very large amplitude. That's exactly what's going on here. So these labels highlight resonances with selected modes, and uh, these are in fact G modes. So this is the G15 mode, G25, G35, and G45. If we zoom in on those four resonances, uh, we can see that they have a, uh, a very distinctive shape uh, that, uh, again, is reminiscent of our, our forced uh, harmonic oscillator. So this is a plot of the uh, amplitude of the surface radial displacement uh, and the phase of the radial, uh, surface radial displacement as a function of detuning parameter, which is basically uh, a, a number that passes through zero when you're exactly at the resonance and, and sort of scales with frequency. 
Uh, it's basically how far you are from the resonance in units of the uh, damping rate. Uh, and uh, these curves, well, the ones here and here, look sur surprisingly like Lorentzian profiles. Uh, <laughs> I've had far worse pop-ups. So <laughs> Uh, and there's a reason for that. This is a forced oscillator system. So uh, when we're dealing with a hum forced harmonic oscillator, we get a, uh, uh, the frequency response of the system is a Lorentzian. In this case, it's a Lorentzian, because uh, exactly the same physics is at work. Uh, what's going on in these panels, however, is, is kind of interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, all of these profiles are the sum of a, a Lorentzian from the particular mode that we're resonant with, plus the wings of the Lorentzians of all of the other modes that we're not resonant with. Okay, so when we're on a resonance, the thing that contributes the most is the Lorentzian uh, from the, the mode we're actually resonant with, but when we're away from a resonance, these sort of non-zero wings are, are this combined effect of all of the other non-resonant modes. Uh, and so we can distinguish between what we call a dynamical tide, which is when we're near a resonance, which is a very strong response, uh, and the uh, distortion of the star actually looks like the free oscillation mode that you're resonant with, but when we're away from a resonance, we have a much weaker response, and the distortion of the star uh, kind of uh, looks almost like the distortion you would expect just if the star was, uh, had come into hydrostatic equilibrium with the potential. So there's two types of response, a resonant one, which we often call a dynamical tide, and a non-resonant one, which we often call an equilibrium tide. So uh, this, uh, 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 this is the same plot I showed you before, but uh, I've overlaid with gray lines that indicate integer multiples of the orbital frequency. Uh, and you'll notice that most of these gray lines do not actually correspond to one of these resonance peaks. So for actual forcing by a companion, most of the harmonics uh, of the orbital frequency do not result uh, in resonant excitation uh, of a dynamical tide. Most of the harmonics actually only contribute towards an equilibrium tide response. Uh, so for the most part, uh, the response of a star to forcing by a companion uh, uh, is non-resonant, but there, are a couple of, there will always be a couple of places where we get uh, uh, forcing quite close to a resonance. So we expect uh, to see basically a superposition of non-resonant excitation of many different modes and resonant excitation of a couple. Uh, so here's an animation that kind of uh, uh, carries this point home. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot to take in here, so I'm probably going to spend quite a while on this slide. So uh, this is uh, an animation of... Uh, I think it's my KOI-54 model uh, with a companion uh, on an eccentric orbit. Uh, I've greatly exaggerated the amplitude of the tide so that you can see it. I've also greatly shrunk the semi-major axis of the orbit so that the companion, which is this sort of uh, uh, whitish thing here, maybe it's a white dwarf or something, who knows, uh, uh, but so you can see it. Uh, so what you'll notice uh, is that every time uh, the companion goes through periastron, there's kind of a big tidal bulge, and then it kind of goes away. Uh, and this tidal bulge is associated initially with a darkening of the star. Uh, this is an example of gravity darkening. Uh, as the surface layers of the star are pulled outwards by the companion, the effective gravity is reduced, and so the radiative flux flowing through the surface goes down. Uh, these three panels here show a view of the system along the x, y, and z axes. Uh, this panel here is a view from the secondary star. Uh, so as we fly in, uh, uh, you can sort of zoom over the surface and go, whoa! Uh, and then these panels here are viewing the star from the same position as this one, but they're just showing the partial tidal response to the star uh, at, at the different harmonics of the orbital frequency. So this is the, the, uh, the distortion of the star at the orbital frequency. This is the distortion at twice the orbital frequency, three times, four times, five times, and so on. And the percentages tell you how much of the star's variability is contributed by that harmonic. Down at the bottom, 
we have the light curve. And this is the classical light curve of a heartbeat star. Away from periastron, uh, it's kind of low amplitude wiggling around. At periastron, we get the big ba-dum of the heartbeat. Uh, and so uh, what you're seeing here is the combined effects of an equilibrium tide and some dynamical tides. So the oscillation away from periastron, you'll notice, is kind of periodic. If you screw up, it's sort of quasi-periodic. And if we count the number of peaks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen-ish, let's say. So fourteen peaks uh, uh, beyond, uh, uh, during one cycle. Uh, we'll see in the next slide, that's actually coming from uh, the fact that the fourteenth harmonic of the orbital frequency is quite close to being in resonance with one of the star's free oscillation modes. So we get that dynamical tide that's always occurring, and then near periastron, we get the equilibrium tide, uh, which actually comes from all of the other harmonics, uh, 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 basically interfering with each other constructively to cause a big distortion to the star. Away from periastron, that constructive interference goes away. In fact, it's destructive, uh, and we, uh, the equilibrium tide is small. Okay, so this is a Fourier decomposition of the light curve I showed you in the previous panel. Uh, and you can see that the amplitude of uh, all of the different harmonics labeled by the uh, index K kind of forms a relatively smooth envelope. So it's all of these different uh, harmonics are contributing towards that large equilibrium tide at periastron that disappears when you're away from periastron because all of these different harmonics no longer constructively interfere. And then on top of that, there's one mode here. Uh, it's actually at a harmonic index of 13. I counted 14. This one's actually 13. But it's, it's abnormally large, uh, and that's a sort of uh, a, a near resonance with one of the star's free oscillation modes, and that gives us the dynamical tide that you can see at all phases of the orbit. Uh, so uh, all of that uh, 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 discussion really focused on the variability uh, that comes about uh, from tides in a heartbeat system. Uh, this is uh, a plot focusing more on the secular orbital evolution, so how the orbit changes over long time scales. Uh, using the responses produced by gyre tides, we can calculate the rate of change of eccentricity and semi-major axis uh, and the spin rates of the stars uh, and the rate of change of the longitude of periastron. Uh, uh, this is a plot of the uh, circularization time scale, so it's like the inverse rate of change uh, of the eccentricity. Uh, as a function of uh, uh, orbital period in a, uh, in a system comprising uh, a five solar mass B-type star with, a, I think, a, a two solar mass point mass. Uh, and uh, you can see that the rate of change of eccentricity kind of hovers around uh, 10 to the 8 years. So pretty long time scale. That's 100 million years, which is kind of comparable to the main sequence lifetime of this star. So not very exciting. Uh, but at certain points, the time scale becomes much, much shorter. And in fact, it gets down almost to 10 to the minus 4 years, uh, which is less than a day. Uh, now, uh, you shouldn't really believe the results way down here, because if the orbit is changing on a time scale that's less than the orbital period, then our assumption that we can do a nice Fourier uh, uh, decomposition of the orbit, that the orbit... Uh, uh, remains uh, uh, time invariant, breaks down. But what this is telling us is that at certain uh, orbital frequencies, the uh, rate of change of eccentricity uh, can be very, very, very large. Uh, and the star will undergo very rapid orbital evolution. Uh, now, the curves are color-coded uh, according to the sign of the uh, circularization time scale. Uh, when it's positive, that means the orbit is getting more circular, but there are places where, uh, uh, shown in blue, uh, where the circularization time scale is, becomes negative, and that actually means the orbit is ma being made less circular and more eccentric. Uh, and that actually occurs in this system uh, because this is a five solar mass star in the middle of the main sequence. What do we know about five solar mass stars in the middle of the main sequence regards to pulsation? Well, 
They pulsate. They're slowly pulsating. It's a slowly pulsating B star. Okay. Uh, and in this star, uh, the modes uh, whose labels are highlighted in black are actually unstable towards the Kappa mechanism. And it's exactly these modes that correspond uh, with these uh, 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 negative uh, rates of change of eccentricity that will actually cause uh, inverse tides that actually make the orbit more eccentric. Uh, so th this just naturally uh, drops out of the analysis using giant tides, uh, that if you st have a star that has unstable free oscillations, it can actually drive inverse tides that can, in principle, pump up the eccentricity of the system. So, uh, as a final uh, piece of uh, uh, or discovery that we made with uh, using gyre tides, uh, we found that the weak friction analysis uh, done by Piet Hutt that really provides the foundational narrative for how people think binary systems change over time, uh, this doesn't work uh, in uh, stars with radiative envelopes. So, B stars, O stars, A stars, maybe some F stars. Uh, uh, Hutt's weak friction analysis uh, predicts that the tidal torque uh, in a binary system should change sign at a well-defined stellar rotation rate that depends on the orbital frequency and the eccentricity of the system. Uh, at uh, a stellar rotation rate slower than this, uh, uh, this value, the star will tend to get spun up by the orbit, uh, and at uh, rotation rates faster than this value, the star will tend to get spun down by the tidal torque. So we expect, based on Hutt's analysis, for stars to evolve to this well-defined pseudo-synchronous rate and then for the, uh, 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 ch further changes in the star's rotation rate to only occur because its eccentricity is changing. Uh, this plot here shows that we can't reproduce this for a B-star model. This is a plot uh, of the tidal torque uh, as a function of rotation frequency. Orange points show a positive torque, so at low rotation rates we certainly the tide certainly spins the star up, uh, and at higher rotation rates, these blue points indicate a negative torque, uh, so that the tide certainly spins the star down. Uh, but there is no well-defined point at which the torque vanishes. Uh, there is a sort of crossover between the two regimes, but it, it doesn't occur at Hutt's pseudo-synchronous rate. Uh, and this really comes down to the fact, as we showed in a follow-up paper uh, to our giant tides paper, that the weak friction approximation does not work in stars with radiative envelopes. I can say a little bit more about that if you're curious uh, during questions. Uh, so, uh, that's uh, what I did on my adventure. Uh, on the return home, I uh, can reflect on uh, what I learned from my trip, which is that uh, stellar tides, far from being this really strange uh, 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 field of study, are actually just the reverse side of the same coin. That uh, Stellar oscillations on one side uh, and uh, uh, stellar tides on the other. In principle, they can offer us insights into stellar interiors that are complementary to astroseismology. Uh, but I should caution that people have been saying this for a decade, and actually coming up with definitive uh, worked examples, applications, is proving challenging. Uh, the problem is, is that those wonderful uh, resonances with free oscillation modes uh, are incredibly sensitive to all of the input parameters. Uh, and so uh, right now we're still trying to figure out uh, how to do uh, robust uh, inferences uh, on stars' internal structures from observations of tides. Uh, we learned during our trip, myself and Mung, that uh, uh, pseudo-synchronization uh, then leading to circularization, uh, that, uh, this narrative likely doesn't work in radiative stars. Uh, and this is important because uh, the, the stars that uh, uh, evolved to become progenitors of uh, uh, gravitational waves uh, when they were on the main sequence, they were O and B type stars that had radiative envelopes. Uh, more broadly, the phenomenological space occupied by stellar tides, all of the weird stuff that stellar tides can do, remains really poorly explored. Uh, we, we uncovered during our expedition some really surprising things. One of the things we discovered that I don't have time to talk about today uh, is the fact that a... Uh, a numerical technique used to calculate the tidal response that many people in the field have been using, where you decompose the response as a superposition of the star's normal modes, doesn't actually work. Uh, it breaks down in stars with radiative envelopes. Uh, so lots of big surprises, lots more exploration to be done. Uh, so for future trips, 
Uh, I think applying gyrotides to specific systems is uh, an obvious low-hanging fruit, uh, but for that, I would need to team up with observers. Uh, Coriolis force effects and spin orbit misalignment are currently uh, neglected in gyrotides, but they're high on the list uh, to go in. I'm hoping during my sabbatical year to get them in. Tidally tilted and confined pulsations, which has been a, a rich uh, a seam of, of exploration in Leuven, uh, I don't yet fully understand all of the theory behind it, so I'm just kind of playing catch up there. Uh, and then at some point, we need to integrate all of this new capability back into MESA uh, so that we can improve on MESA's treatments uh, of tidal evolution, which at the moment is based on uh, Hutt's weak friction theory. And with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, for a very interesting talk. Uh, time for questions. Thank you, Rich, for the great talk. Um, I was wondering, when you have these resonances mm -hmm. um, between the tides and the, well, the boring uh, oscillation modes of the mm -hmm. star, um, are the way you're currently computing that, is that um, like the star would be just a normal spherical star, or does that also give you some indication like how the tide change the oscillation cavity and the frequencies that you get out of that? So uh, that's a very good question. For, for, for close-in uh, uh, binaries, uh, there's certainly sort of kind of a background distortion to the star that, that, uh, that then your tidal resonance will then sit on top of and in principle probe the fact that this is no longer a spherical cavity. Uh, but because uh, in this analysis we're treating the tide as a linear perturbation to a mm -hmm. spherical star, we, we can't yet take that into account. Uh, but that's certainly something that uh, uh, could be uh, included in the future, and I think that will be necessary to properly do tidally tilted or trapped oscillations or, yeah. or, or, or tides. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for that great talk. Um, you mentioned a bit that some of the uh, very tight end binaries have a very rapidly spinning star that may be indicative of, uh, of this, uh, this spin up. Are there other observational uh, features, you know, different abundance patterns in the surface that could be identified for a, a star that's been spun up this way? And can you use that to identify binaries that were born as a binary versus stars that, binaries that were uh, tidally captured? Uh, that, that's a great question as well. Uh, I'm not aware of the literature, I'm, I'm, my knowledge of the literature in that respect is kind of limited, but I, uh, I wonder whether there's, uh, uh, there could be some evidence that, uh, uh, for instance, heightened chromospheric activity in, in uh, close-in systems. I, I, I should add that that plot was for uh, star planet systems with a hot Jupiter. Uh, so it's not quite the same as a binary system, but in principle, you know, one could go looking for signatures of more rapid rotation uh, uh, that's correlated with having a hot Jupiter closer in. However, I would also worry that there might be some kind of weird magnetospheric star-planet interactions going on uh, that might, for instance, affect chromospheric signatures. Uh, but I think probably the best answer I can give you is you're asking a theoretician uh, a question about <laughs> observations. Uh, so my knowledge is limited, but in principle, yes. More questions? Yes. Hello, thank you so much for the talk. It was very nicely explained. Um, you can assume I know nothing on this topic, just for this question. That's how uh, I began. A lot of my former colleagues or OA PhD students were looking at the eccentricity period problem where there is a gap in the in the middle, so population synthesis showed that there should be a uniform kind of distribution between eccentricity and period for mm -hmm. binary systems, but there was always this gap in the middle that I remember they were always presenting at their thesis defenses. It, is this work kind of adding a, a sort of dimension to that um, field Possibly. of study or not? Yeah, that's Possibly. my uh, question. The, uh, it's long been known that if, if one just applies what we think of as our theory of tides and, and try and reproduce observations of period versus eccentricity. There are features in the observed distribution that we cannot reproduce. Uh, now, uh, I should 
Caution, however, that, well, so on the one hand, Giotides may be able to just step in and go, oh, it's all solved. Uh, but uh, my expectation is that, uh, uh, is, is probably a little more pessimistic. Uh, the new stuff we found with Giotides in terms of how uh, uh, the orbital evolution changes when one treats radiative damping properly uh, is only really important for stars which have mainly radiative envelopes. And most of the period eccentricity uh, 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 measurements are for lower mass stars that have convective envelopes. Uh, and right now, my code doesn't have much to say about those. Uh, it can simulate them, but it doesn't predict anything that's that different from what's already known. Uh, so uh, it may be there's additional physics I have to sneak in there uh, that uh, is necessary to explain the observations. Uh, for instance, uh, it's become uh, apparent uh, in recent years that wave breaking in the radiative core of stars may be important uh, uh, to understanding tidal evolution. Uh, but for now, I'm not expecting any big... Uh, I'm not expecting my code to overthrow what's known about low mass, uh, uh, tidal evolution in low mass stars. Yeah, Bob. Well, perhaps adding to that, maybe you can say something, because a lot of what they talk about here is these post-AGB binaries. And in that situation, you're probably dealing with a post-mass transfer situation mm -hmm. that might be close to circular, but then you have a post-AGB star that, is not, that doesn't have a convective envelope. So post-AGB in the sense that it's, it's basically a, a strip star. Yeah, so yeah. it's a contracting strip star, mm -hmm. and potentially if there's competing time scales where things might work, you have a radiative envelope during that phase. So okay, you can talk about eccentricity pumping to a radiative envelope star and apply these kind of things. Yeah, I mean, okay, that's a very good point. We have time for more questions. No need. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so I really only know about these things in the context of a planet and a moon. Um, and I know that for gas giants, there's this theory that the moon, so the secondary, can actually lock with the resonant mode. Is this also a thing that you're considering here? So, uh, 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 the uh, yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm not personally considering it, but people have thought about it for probably a, a couple of decades now, the possibility uh, that you can get into a, a, a resonance lock uh, with uh, uh, one of these free oscillation mode resonances. Uh, and this can actually drive uh, faster evolution than you would expect. Because in fact, those resonances, even though they, uh, the orbital evolution rate is very rapid during a resonance, the star actually evolves through the resonance very, very quickly. It's just internal structure changes due to its nuclear burning mean that it only spends a very brief amount of time in a resonance. Uh, but it's possible uh, to get uh, a sort of cancellation between the evolutionary changes or, or a match between the evolutionary changes and the orbital changes so that it remains sort of on the shoulder of a resonance throughout its whole main sequence lifetime. Uh, and this is predicted to be a, a very important mechanism for uh, uh, actually getting substantial changes to the orbit from these resonances. Uh, now, in principle... Uh, Giotides can sort of simulate that. Uh, in practice, uh, I haven't actually tried it yet. Uh, and, you know, that's something I should try. But certainly the, uh, a lot of the uh, solar system understanding of, of tidal resonances has transferred over to stellar tides, uh, and people are sort of actively working on that. Okay, thank you. All right, here is time for the last question. Hi, Rich. Thanks very much. Uh, I want to follow up a bit on, on Vincent's comment. Um, so, yeah, my question is basically, can you actually do um, any sort of astroseismology or, or tides in non-spherical cavities? Is that in principle possible? Uh, yes. Uh, is that it, doable? <laughs> th there are many things that are in principle possible. Yes. Uh, <laughs> is it doable? Uh, yes, but you're going to need a bigger computer. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, it's actually the same with the Coriolis force. To do the Coriolis right. force properly, uh, you, uh, you need to start uh, uh, include. You, you essentially need a, a two-dimensional uh, sure. uh, solver uh -huh. uh, rather than a 1D solver that we're okay. currently using. Is there a, is there a, a clever trick one could? Because uh, that actually, I want to want to advertise a bit my work in that from the hydrostatic side, the mainland uh -huh. side, it is possible to um, get the equilibrium hydrostatic profile of a tidally distorted star in one dimension. So I was wondering, maybe there's some, some similar trick we, one could do uh, on so, the oscillation side. So you're, you're side. just thinking about the, like the uh, Chandrasekhar-Milne sort of expansion that gets the, an, an average yeah. an average radius uh, of each level surface. Yes. Uh, I think in, in principle one could do something like that, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, unless one's using it to explain uh, a new class of phenomenon where it's just sufficient to show that something interesting can happen. Right. Uh, I don't. I, I don't think it's something you could use for any kind of quantitative prediction. Sure. Uh, but I think it could be useful in, in demonstrating how some new weird effect happens because of this okay. distortion. Right. All right. Good. Okay. We are at the hour, so let's uh, thank Rich again and see you next week, guys.